All right. Seeing that it's 10 a.m., I'll go ahead and kick us off. Um, so welcome, everybody, to the panel Data-Driven Impact Innovations and Evidence-Based Philanthropy. Um, my name is Josh, and I'm a first-year Master's in Global Affairs and MBA Joint Degree student at the Yale Jackson Institute and the Yale School of Management. Um, this panel is really about ensuring that funding decisions actually lead to their intended social impact. So we'll discuss how donors and implementers can generate and use evidence to inform decision making, um, even when the generation of rigorous evidence is often bound by uh, financial time and operational constraints. We have a really exciting lineup of guests joining us today. Uh, first, Ruth Levine is the CEO of ID Insight a global advisory data analytics and research organization that generates evidence to help development leaders maximize their social impact. Rakesh Rajani is the vice president of programs at CoImpact, a global philanthropic collaborative that aims to support partners uh, in the global south. Asif Saleh is the executive director of BRAC, the world's largest nonprofit organization and a global leader in implementing evidence-based programs to assist people in extremely poor, conflict-prone and post-disaster settings. And Neil Buddy Shah is a managing director at GiveWell, a nonprofit dedicated to finding outstanding giving opportunities and helping donors decide where and how to give. This panel will be moderated by Professor Mushfiq Mubarak, who is a professor of economics at Yale University, the Yale School of Management. Um, several quick housekeeping notes before we kick off. In terms of an agenda, we will have 45 minutes of moderated discussion, followed by 10 minutes of audience Q&A and a round of final remarks by the panelists. Pete, please feel free to post any questions that you have in the session chat on the right. Professor Mubarak will select questions to pose to the panelists uh, during the Q&A portion. Uh, we understand that you all have an option to share your audio and video. We will ask that you please refrain from doing that, uh, from requesting to do so, uh, just because we don't want to clutter the screen. Um, you will all have a chance to share your audio and video and uh, network with the panelists during the informal networking session directly after this panel, uh, where you can continue to dis discuss the topic with your fellow attendees. Um, the link to this uh, networking session is in the description below, and we will also post it in the chat. We are going to a different space that is not recorded, uh, where up to 20 people can share their videos simultaneously. With that, I'll pass it on to Professor Mubarak. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Josh. And uh, this is a really impressive panel and very diverse in terms of the uh, perspectives on philanthropy and evidence that it uh, uh, represents from, from different parts of the um, the, the ecosystem around evidence and philanthropy. And uh, so congratulations to the uh, YPC team and Josh for putting this together. I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to learn a lot today. So I wanted to start by giving you a really brief overview of like extremely brief overview of the history of evidence uh, in philanthropy and not just philanthropy, but the other complexities that, that people on the panel all deal with, not just philanthropy coming from the Western world to the global South, but also um, how to effectively run government programs or advise on multilateral um, investments um, from, from multilateral donors or even bilateral donors uh, at the government level. Uh, so from the World Bank, IMF, uh, but also government to government aid. And, um, and so the, a, a very brief history is that, you know, philanthropy used to play a much smaller role in the global financial flows, like philanthropy type financial flows that were going from the north to the south, and it has started playing an increasingly important role, probably reflecting the fact that there's been increases in global wealth inequality, and you know private individuals now hold a lot of that wealth. And um, and it's also the case that maybe about 25, 30 years ago, we only paid lip service to evidence informed philanthropy, right? in the sense that say the World Bank was making a loan to the government of Ghana or to the government of Uttar Pradesh, right? um, you know, in, in that, in those loan documents, there would be talk about evidence and you'd, you'd um, keep some of the program budget uh, uh, to, to generate evidence and evaluate the program. 
right? But we've, I mean, many of us have uh, participated in that process and um, it wasn't really rigorous approaches to, to evidence. And so what's happened in the last 15, 20 years is this insistence on evidence, right? Mm -hmm. And this has culminated in this big push towards really high quality, rigorous evidence like th those coming from randomized control trials. So borrowing some methodologies from medicine, from the field of medicine and trying to apply that to international development. Mm -hmm. And um, and that has uh, posed a new set of challenges. So one set of challenges is like for uh, people like Asif Saleh, right? How do we now reorient our organizations in order to generate and present that evidence while we are also trying to run these programs effectively, right? And because these organizations were not designed to uh, generate evidence, they were designed to implement programs, right? Uh, there is then questions for donors as to you know how can we responsibly um uh insist on evidence right such that we don't put too much of a burden on implementers who really should be doing the work of improving people's lives right but at the same time we don't want to waste uh scarce resources on ineffective programs right? and here the pressures and the challenges are come, coming from many different directions so for example um on the one hand um you know you want to become more rigorous by saying okay no 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 you know just like comparing uh, people who received the program before they got it versus after is not good enough. Telling a few stories or anecdotes about how some people's lives were improved, just that just isn't good enough, right? We need to do better than that. We need to have representative samples. We need to have large samples. We need to have good counterfactuals that tell us what, um, uh, plausibly tell us what the people's lives might have looked like absent that program as a way to um, uh, in, infer what the effect of the program is. But on the other hand, um, even though the strategies we've adopted for medicine are quite rigorous in some dimensions, as Rakesh will tell us as, a, as representing an organization that in, that's interested in systems change, that these randomized control trials may also not be very good fits for yeah. uh, evaluating effects at some large complex scale, right? Where you're trying to engage in systems change and not just running programs, one off programs one at a time, right? And so on, on the one hand, you know, we have these uh, we, we, we have these pressures coming from one side, which is that, okay, if we insist on too much rigor, we might be undermining the mission of organizations. On the other hand, there is also talk, you know, uh, in, including from Yrise, uh, an organization at Yale that we, that we lead, that make perhaps the evidence that we are insisting on is actually not good enough. Okay? So there's a lot to think through and work through now. Um, so I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing from uh, everybody. And I'll go in the order that uh, uh, just ask uh, each of the panelists to make some uh, a short opening statement. And I'll go in the order that you that you see in, um, in, in the description of the panel. So we'll start with uh, Ruth uh, Living, uh, Ruth, who's the Chief Executive Officer of ID Insight. Yeah, thanks very much. Really delighted to be here with uh, friends and to see the list of really wonderful folks who have joined uh, to hopefully be part of this conversation a little bit later uh, in the hour. So, Mushrik, I'm extremely impressed with how you managed to capture the history in three minutes. And I think, you know, it um, really highlighted some of the main trends just a couple of uh, points that I'll make uh, particularly relevant to our work at ID Insight. And that is that I think that um, there's a whole range of different kinds of information, data, evidence that not only can be brought to bear on decisions that funders make, that governments make, that NGOs make, but actually that, that um, not only can be brought to bear, but, but actually is used in virtually every decision. So I think that, um, kind of the characterizing the use of rigorous evidence as sort of deterministic or, you know, that, that decisions are made mechanistically based on uh, the available rigorous evidence is really only part of the, the story. There are very few funders or NGOs certainly who make decisions based on that. So I think from our perspective, recognizing the breadth of uh, uh, data and evidence that can be brought to bear and ensuring the rigor across all of those types um, is really the, um, you know, sort of the, the path forward.
making it it's the statement of uh, 2020 and 2021 too, I guess. Uh, Rakesh, uh, next. Um, Rakesh is representing Co-Impact. Thank you, Moshvik, um, and thank you, Ruth, for that as well. And I'm really glad to see how many people have joined this session. Um, so I think a core question I ask is, who wakes up in the morning excited about evidence uh, and using evidence? And in my experience, I think you have two constituencies come to mind. One is donors. But the thing is, when donors get excited, even when they are trying, you know, even when we're trying to be genuine and curious, it's always laced with this anxiety, right? Because they are interested in is the money making a difference? And it can often create a set of incentives around fudging and not having open conversations. And certainly, a lot depends on what sorts of signals donors send. The other group that gets excited, I think, is the researchers, people like Mushvik, perhaps. And in that's great, but what you often find, or at least my own experience with a lot of research is, is they may be interested in a set of issues, set of hypotheses that may not relate to what the practitioners and policymakers care about in the morning. And I think that, to me, this disconnect perhaps between donors and some of the mixed incentives they bring and researchers and perhaps some of the narrow interests they bring on one side and on the other hand, what practitioners, policymakers really need to, to, to make things happen. And, and so think especially of a government person, right? It's, I think it's a little in, easier for NGOs, but think about you working government. You are in the Department of Policy or you're responsible for a lot of implementation. That person uh, needs to know what works. Yes, I think that's key. But they need to know what works in that particular context in that particular moment and how to navigate that system. And a lot of the time, I find that people who generate evidence don't have much empathy for that or much curiosity and interest in that. And if you don't address that and grapple with that, and it's not about just giving an answer, it's about actually grappling how we figure this out together and creating, if you will, a community of practice. Unless we do that, the risk is that even really good, robust evidence will not take flight because you have not answered the how do we make this happen in, in practice. Uh, and, and I have particular empathy for people in government. And I think those of us who care about evidence just don't spend enough time thinking, you know, putting ourselves in the shoes of people in government. Thank you, Rakesh. Uh, uh, Asif, uh, he's representing BRAC in Bangladesh. Uh, I echo your three-minute summary it was fantastic and uh, and uh, wonderful being here in this panel and I'm gonna be uh, I guess a bit more probing in here uh, in a sense because I think some of the things you mentioned uh, in your intro Mushrik, are one part of the uh, problem that is facing the sector uh, but overall I think uh, this entire social sector is very ripe for disruption uh, essentially, there are lots of challenges, and I, I, I basically uh, say that from the perspective of an implementer who is also, in some sense, uh, depend on uh, financing from donors, but on the other hand, compared to some of the other NGOs, um, I'm also a lot more self-sufficient. Uh, so I, I basically say that from, from that point of view that uh, I think some of our best work happens when we actually do not have to depend on donors and fund some of the work that uh, from our own financing uh, because that's where we are not kind of driven by short timeline uh, driven by need to show anecdotal stories that you mentioned uh, because i think essentially uh, development implementation in difficult areas this is uh, there are a lot of nuances and it, it, it's tough. I and mean, we're talking about long-term behavior change. We're talking about operating in very complex environment. And, and I think oftentimes it gets very trivialized in, in these stories and other things. And essentially the challenges and, and some of the um, uh, difficulties that we often uh, have to deal with, um, I don't, I don't think anybody has time to listen to any of those. Uh, there is also very little room for failure uh, when it comes to uh, donors. And uh, so everybody wants to hear the good stories and everybody wants to hear success stories. And uh, so essentially that leads to a lot of the dysfunction uh, in this sector as well. So then 
um, the NGOs, the implementing partners, they go for the stories and they want to tick the boxes. So what gets lost in this whole picture is then, then, then these long-term developments, some of the things that you know that in the field they are not working, um, but you can't tell them. Um, um, so I think, um, uh, I mean, we are in a fortunate position because I think a couple of our biggest donors uh, basically said to us uh, uh, that, you know, that, you know, you are going to be our strategic partners in a sense that uh, we will give you a financing based on your strategy and you will have independence on choosing that and then you come back with results and stuff and that's very unusual when it comes to that but so i think uh, from uh, so so definitely there needs to be a lot more strategic conversation that needs to happen between donors funders and uh, and implementers rather than very short timeline driven uh, success story um, incentivization led type of ecosystem that we have we are in right now in most of the cases thank you okay thank you that was uh thank you for speaking so candidly that was definitely a very different perspective and we should uh probe that a little bit more throughout the um uh, throughout this next hour and uh, buddy yeah great I'm really excited to be in conversation and what everyone said resonated quite a bit so uh, you know i won't repeat some of those points i think there are two main things on my mind when it comes to evidence-based or evidence-informed philanthropy. You know, the first is that there's a big project ahead of us to expand the percent of the sector that really thinks in this way. You know, within this group, there's a lot of nuance we can and should get into about how to do it more effectively. But I think one of the most important conversations is how can we take success cases, lessons learned and failures from the history of evidence-informed policymaking or evidence-informed philanthropy and use that as a kind of spearhead into growing this because i think right now it's still um, you know a minority of philanthropy and i think one of the things that's necessary in order to do that is to start with the moral case you know we get very quickly lost in the wonky details of evidence-based philanthropy but at its core we're trying to figure out how do we save and improve lives as much as possible with a fixed set of resources and when you start to look at the evidence, the types of decisions you make and the number of lives you can save or improve with the same set of resources start to look dramatically different when you're making evidence-informed decisions versus when you're not. And I think that the community as a whole should own that moral stance much more aggressively in order to start the conversation and grow the movement. So that's on the like growing the space of evidence-based philanthropy. And I think there's a lot of work to be done there. I think within the evidence-based philanthropy movement, there's still a lot of room for improvement. And you know, from our position at GiveWell, where last year we moved around $220 million, and we're trying to figure out how to do as much good as possible with that finite set of resources. There's two areas where I think the evidence-based philanthropy movement can really um, evolve further. The first is to move away from this binary sense of, we ran an RCT, did the program work or not? Um, you know, programs don't work or not work. There's a gradation, especially whether you're an implementer, a government, or a philanthropy, of trying to choose the best program possible with those resources. Um, and just to give you two quick examples, within the field of malaria in East Africa and evidence-based programs that quote unquote work, if you compare seasonal malaria chemo prevention versus community case management of malaria, both have rigorous evidence of effectiveness but the cost effectiveness is substantially different, such that you can save many more lives with the former intervention than the latter. And then even within community case management of malaria, there's an evidence-informed angle of where can that program be most effective with the fixed set of resources? And GiveWell had partnered with USAID and the government of Uganda, and you see just by applying evidence tools to target and predict which districts in Uganda are most at risk, you can save twice as many lives through the same intervention that you would have with a less targeted, less evidence-informed approach of where you should implement. And so I think that you know, even amongst people that buy into this, there's a lot of room for improvement by honing in on the cost dimension. How much good can you do per dollar, not just does the program work in some abstract binary sense? Thanks very much. Uh, so I'd like to we get started by taking some cues of the conversations uh, that we that we just started. So, uh, so one is we just heard from Asif that there are these fundamental uncertainties, right? Um, when you're when you're actually running a program, 
in the field, right? And this now creates a tension and, and the incentives are such that it actually might lead us down to the, down the wrong path, which is that we are trying to be very responsive to evidence, to cost effectiveness calculations, et cetera, right? But in the process, right, if our funding is tied to what that number shows, then we have all the wrong incentives, right, to maintain programs. So what's the, what is the solution to that? It seems like the system is built and the set of incentives that are thrown at us is built for people to not uh, prioritize uh, lives saved or lives improved in the way that Buddy was talking about, right? But to prioritize continuation of a program, right? Uh, that seems like a really fundamental challenge, right? That it's, it's, I, I, I personally, I don't know what the solution to that is. So any reactions to that? Um, Rakesh, would you like to take that? Can certainly start, I'm sure. Other people. So look, I uh, clearly, the, what Buddy you are saying around more donors getting, educating ourselves and getting better at this would, would help. The, the thing I worry about is, is I think if this is led by donors, I worry about the kind of warped incentives. What I would love is if donors can support a constituency of practitioners, government and civil society practitioners, to make the case for this, you know, to create a manifesto, to be able to socialize this, to demonstrate what difference it makes, uh, and to figure out the the political economy calculations to get a country, for example, thinking in this way, right? How do you get a, a progressive cabinet to be able to see why this matters, to understand the moral case, but also to make the understand the political case for it? And, and if we can demonstrate that at those sorts of levels, I think it will be more powerful in the long run than just a group of woke donors. So, so Ruth, I, I guess the same question for you, but from the perspective of somebody uh, developing the evidence, do you feel any of this um, discomfort or like tensions coming from two sides where the donors who are funding the evidence base, they have something in mind, whereas the practitioners who you're working with um, are facing like some different realities and they don't quite match up? Yeah. Um... I'll take this from a couple of different angles. So first is we are very, very fortunate, I think, to have uh, found a set of funders and increasingly a broader set of funders who appreciate that their one of their key roles is to support work that will enhance the learning and iterative improvement of the work of NGOs or government agencies. And so our work is often, well, it's always in service of decision makers, typically in service of decision makers within the, the government or the nonprofit organization, and very much kind of shaped around what their needs are. So for example, we're, we're working with BRAC uh, and trying to find ways to use kind of the ongoing flows of data to help optimize the, the services that are provided by community health workers. And it's very much, you know, as uh, um, if you can speak to this yourself, I'm sure, but but it's very much oriented around uh, supporting that organization's what, one of their goals. And so in that sense, the donors are, are very, um, you know, really very much aligned with, as I said, the kind of ongoing quality enhancement of, of the work. Just a... a the other comment I'll make is that there are times when we are um, designing and conducting what I think of as high stakes impact evaluations where, uh, so say for example, within the context of a development impact bond or other funding decision that hinges on whether the impact that's measured reaches a certain th pre-established threshold and then funding will result from that. Those I would say are, you know, their um, uh, way in which we can apply our, you know, rigorous skill set to some uh, hard problems. They're also quite challenging projects because of the um, the kind of uh, intensity of the incentives on the part of both the NGO and whoever the funders are. 
So I would say that um, those have a lot of merits uh, and they are also among the most complicated projects that I've observed and I've only been at ID Insight for about nine months, but uh, they are quite challenging to implement. Uh, just turn the conversation around a little bit because I've been noticing you know, in the chat window who's been um, signing in to the program uh, today. And so some on a discrepancy I noticed is that the panel is designed uh, partly to be like in the set of people we chose as panelists uh, to be a conversation about mostly about international development. That's the space that most of you are working in. Um, whereas many of the attendees are, it looks like they're working in and around the US, not only physically present in the United States, but also they're working on programs that are local and about local economic development, domestic economic development. Right? So just, uh, just to make sure that sort of every, you know, it's, this is an inclusive panel, given the interests of the, of the, of the people who are joining in. Uh, do any of you have um, any comments you can make about your work in domestic economic development in the United States? Um, would anyone like to take that? So for example, does GiveWell have any programs to support uh, work in the, in, inside the United States? But... Yeah, no, so, so GiveWell focuses entirely international development um and you know historically maybe a decade ago at the start there were a couple of things that we did domestically the main reason being you know we're as i said at the top trying to save and improve as many lives per dollar spent as possible um and those dollars just go much further um in the poorest parts of the world uh both because uh you know whether you're looking in health or economic development the scale of say infant mortality is often 10, 20 X in the poorest parts of the world and in the lowest income parts of the world. And then the scale of um, poverty also in, in a low income part is substantially different. So that's obviously not to say that they're not worthy causes domestically. Um, but I do think that all of the same principles apply, whether you're working in a high income environment or a low or middle income environment. Um, and, and, and those principles are essentially, you know, as people are saying, are donors and NGOs setting the right incentives for experimentation and failure so that it's not too high stakes too early, but then eventually having some high stakes incentives such that the programs that don't deliver end up getting changed or dropped um, and more resources flow to the programs that do work. So I think a lot of those principles apply even though um, you know the places where we're working can be quite different from those of a lot of the attendees. I could just make one one quick comment on this and uh, sort of a theory that I think bears out, which is that the further we are away from the context that we're talking about, the more the less kind of nuanced contextual knowledge we have, the more we kind of gravitate toward a rather simplistic view about, as Buddy was saying, sort of something works or it doesn't work. And when you're embedded in a particular context, for me in the United States, I am fully aware of the, you know, many of the kind of political dynamics, the difficult operating environment that many NGOs uh, exist in. And so, you know, uh, maybe, you know, less likely to think, oh, well, you know, an RCT is gonna give me the key information that I need to make a decision, at least in, in isolation from understanding the context. So I think it is actually a, a bit of a characteristic of, of international donors that there's this somewhat simplistic view. Yeah, and then uh, I may just add a footnote to that. I think, so following what Ruth just said, clearly representation matters in terms of who the researchers are, who is setting the research agenda, research questions. You know, just getting that right is going to be a key part of, uh, and, and that applies as much in the U.S. as it applies around the world. Yeah, and and I just want to add, I, I think I, I didn't want to sound too negative, but I, I think there there are two kinds of things happening. I think one thing, something that Mushfik, you mentioned that we are seeing, of course, the rise of a lot of these new foundation who is more and more dominating this space rather than the bilateral relationships we had used to have in the past with the various uh, governments. Um, so that also, the, that shift has also uh, kind of led to some more kind of rise of, uh, you know, the Rakesh works for co-impact, for example, 
I mean, I think they, uh, these kinds of consortium, which are being formed by different partners, they tend to focus on problems. And I think tend to be a much more like focused on like, this is what it takes. And there's a long sort of process in terms of identification of the problem and who's working on them. And, and, uh, and I have been very, uh, I actually having applied for a co-impact proposal and being failed on this. I, I want to say that that the kind of rigor I actually had to go through um, actually impressed me because these guys came, these guys saw, went to the field, looked at our evaluations and stuff. And that's a good thing uh, because oftentimes I think these are the kind of engagement that is needed. But what happens instead in a, or used to happen in the majority of the cases is, you know, you get into these proposal writing contests, uh, right? So you actually end up so much spending so much time in this writing fancy proposals, which may you know, have no correlation in terms of what you have done in the past or what sort of uh, things you are capable of. Uh, so that often uh, becomes a very uh, strange way to identify who's going to deliver the impact that you're looking for. Um, and, 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 and the other trend that is shifting is also from the bilateral side is that uh, everyone is asking that, you know, you need to change systems and stuff, right? So that means that we need to work with the governments and uh, so, which is absolutely important, but at the same time, we see that globally, there's a trend of um, um, the civil society space are being more and more constrained. Working with governments is becoming very, very difficult as well. So I think, yeah, and, and oftentimes the a lot of the donor money from the bilaterals are going to uh, governments, and those projects are impossible to evaluate uh, when it comes. So, so I would also echo that in a sense that the other, I think the, the we shouldn't just think about evaluations and stuff from um, from a, a long drawn out RCT process, uh, uh, but but looking at how we can cleverly use data more effectively on a regular real-time basis. And, and Ruth mentioned some of these just things that we are doing together with uh, ID Insight and has been very much driven by the fact that we want to know uh, on the spot um, and at any given point what is working and what needs tweaking. And that's, we are being able to leverage the real-time data uh, uh, that is we are getting. And, you know, and the fundamental thing is, asking the right question. Are we asking the right questions? Well, is it working? And then going back and back and back. So I'll stop here. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Um, I, you know, while you were talking, I was thinking that, you know, is it possible for us within the next uh, 45 minutes to generate some evidence within this panel? Yeah. And for that, um, so I'm thinking that, you know, all of us, or maybe most of us have lived through like this, uh, the, the the arc of the importance of evidence in um, in philanthropy uh, over the last twenty years, um, and so we've experienced a world where now we're you know there's a lot of insistence on evidence and people are coming and checking and doing very very careful monitoring right and um, you know using a variety of methods like as I've just mentioned co impact coming in and. Uh, examining systems or uh, Roots organization is conducting a lot of impact evaluations. Uh, GiveWell is a um, consumer of a large number of impact evaluations, right? Whereas we were also in this field, some of us were, I mean, I, um, I don't want to be ageist, but I also shouldn't hold Buddy's youthful good looks against him. Um, so <laughs> we also lived through a world where um, where you know the, it wasn't like this, you know, not everybody was running randomized control trials, and we weren't. So I just wanted to get a sense from all of you, like since you've lived through both, yeah. and we can do a pre-post comparison. How, how how does the world feel different from where you're sitting, right? Um, so can each of you reflect on this? Like how how has your life changed, right? How has your organization changed? Uh, was it better before? Is it was it worse before? Uh, Ruth, do you want to get us started? Yeah, sure. Wow, this is I. I this is something I actually could speak for an hour on. So I will try to be really, really brief. <clears throat> so I worked for the World Bank for a number of years, um, many years ago. When you know the way you characterize things, I think is pretty much right. That that you know, kind of an evaluation of a program was. I always thought of it as like two guys, two weeks, and and. 20 recommendations. It was, 
you know, sort of going out into the field, you go to a few field sites, you write up something that you could have written up when you were sitting at home uh, because it just codifies your own pre-existing views about whether a particular program is, approach is right or not. So again, you know, kind of caricature, but, but not entirely <laughs> wrong. And I became very, very frustrated uh, when I was at the World Bank with the with the experience of ha being in an organization that could not learn. It could not learn partly because of the lack of rigor of the, the evaluations that were done at that time and partly because of all the institutional incentives that were all oriented toward, you know, pushing the money out and seeing that it was successful in, um, in um, whatever the objectives of the, the loan were. Uh, when I went to the Center for Global Development after the World Bank, it was a place where there was a chance to kind of think about, uh, you know, key reforms in the multilateral system, among other things, and worked at that time with um, uh, <laughs> with some pretty well-known people, Esther Duflo, Paul Gertler, um, Francois Bourguignon, and a number of other people, including Nancy Birdsell, my boss at the time, to really think about what um, is the gap in evaluation and what are the solutions to that. And so from that work actually emerged the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation as a separate organization that, that you know, pooled resources for uh, impact evaluations, most of them using experimental design, but definitely not all of them. And it, that was all consistent. It was part of the kind of zeitgeist of the rise of rigorous evaluation as a new tool for uh, decision making. And I think, you know, we've seen the increase over time. So I think you've carried the kind of supply of evidence very, very well. And I think the area where we have been systematically inattentive is really understanding why the uptake and use of that extraordinary body of new knowledge is from uh, impact evaluations is not as robust, that uptake is not as robust as we, you know, really hoped. And um, I, you know, there's a, there's a, a kind of storyline about why that is, but I think that we didn't pay sufficient attention to the context, specificity, and relevance of the evidence, whether it was from trusted and legitimate uh, sources seen as legitimate by the people who we expect to take up that evidence, whether it uh, appears at the time when it can best be used, um, and whether it's conveyed in a way that is that is genuinely understandable by the people who um, who have the potential to make consequential decisions in a better way than they otherwise would. So anyway, apologies for going on and on, but this uh, this is a large part of my unprofessional history. So I appreciate the chance to talk. Okay. Um, Rakesh, do you want to? Thank you. Yeah. You I, I love that listening to that story, Ruth, and it resonates a lot. So, like, look, my own stories. I I started in the in my country, Tanzania, in the 90s, being an activist for more money for education. Uh, we were the country was spending a lot of money in debt. 42 percent of its revenues are going to debt servicing, and it was very little was going to education. And we made the case uh, for why there should be more money in education to build classrooms, get desks, get textbooks. I was a big advocate showing the data that we were failing to do that and we succeeded through HIPAA and so on we did like significantly increase the money in education we all the infrastructure was built and as we all know now thanks to the work of what Asar uh, Prathav does and how we adapted that for called the WESO in East Africa that all that input all that huge like doubling tripling did not lead to improved learning outcomes. So for me, that was a, a pivotal moment to what several of you have referred to, the moral case for education, right? For people like me who wanted those children to learn and thinking that the, you know, increasing the inputs was gonna solve that, to learn that that was not the case was, was really powerful. Um, in the organizations that I've run prior to being inside philanthropy, I think the best part about this movement, this focus on evidence was that it helped us become smarter. It helped us, it helped unpack hypotheses. You know, it made, made us self-aware of our assumptions of why doing A or B would actually lead to C or D. So, 
in that sense, I think I'm I'm enormously grateful, and I'd like to think that the work we did got got smarter, got more effective as a result. The, I think, though, the 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 I agree with what you would say the, in terms of the supply demand. On the demand side, uh, again, reflecting on my own self, we had a somewhat simplistic view that just putting this evidence out there that things are not working, uh, that you know schooling inputs do not lead to learning outcomes for example is going to be sufficient and in fact if we if we did uh, you know kind of um, advocacy and we held you know governments would be held accountable it clearly doesn't work like that in my own country tanzania there is no lack of evidence that's not the case but everything the government is doing now is still more on schooling inputs so i think what we need to do is it's to me it's not only a question around how we package or how we disseminate the evidence. I think we need to think much more about the entire production system of evidence and write, like if you start with the use case or the demand users right from the beginning in how you design your research project and take into account things like psychology, ownership, my sense is we are likely to do better uh, rather than kind of, kind of this this red line between the evidence production and the evidence use. Should I come in, Mushrik? Just uh, yeah, I, I, I'm 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 I, I I'm from a very different background. I I worked um, in the private sector for a long time, but in the uh, daytime I was a working in the investment bank and at nighttime I was an activist like Rakesh, uh, but online activist. But I, I have a lot of respect uh, for uh, for small organization, activistic organization, because the passion is there very much, right? So so when I came back to Bangladesh uh, after uh, being away for a long time, uh, I tried to run my own organization and I, I, I saw, see some questions about small organizations having difficulty. I totally can relate to that. And I had difficulty, and I, I, it, it didn't run uh, after a year. So I, I had to take up a job, and I started working at the UN. And that's when I realized that compared, compared, com completely contrary to the activistic passion that I, the, my organization had, and then what I saw uh, of people in the development sector who get paid for doing something, things like that how the passion is completely not there and, and that's been replaced by development bureaucracy right so so essentially i think that uh, two things I, I found after coming coming to back one is that the passion was there and the second thing was that it was as results driven as private sector is uh, so 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 that means that you kind of sometimes when even the donors are not asking the right questions ignore that you basically use the financing for your own financing of the work that you would be doing. But you, as an organization, yourself have to be authentic and you need to ask those tough questions uh, that, you know, regardless of what you say on the proposal or your report, you need to have your own, own sort of um, uh, answers. And that led to also, I, I saw that, which is a refreshingly different, that, you know, in a, in a design process, researchers were involved and monitors were going back every six months to figure out what's going on. Anthropologists coming in to understand the nuances of uh, behavior changes. So I think all of that, and, and now what I am, I am seeing that essentially, um, that the fundamental arc is that, that you need to ask questions, that is, is this working? You need to be iterative in your approach because nobody has the answer. Uh, and, the, and the second thing I'm, I'm now intrigued, if you talk about the brave new world, again, going back to technology, and, and I'm a, I, I, I was a computer programmer in the past, so everything was very logic driven, that also I feel like that you, are, you know, rather than getting the summary level data that you often were, were you used to do your reporting, uh, now you can actually drill down to almost like to a household level. So, for example, now we are like trying to figure out because BRAC has programs in different things, education, microfinance, and health, and other things. So, a identifying our clients so that we can figure out where they are uh, and uh, not where they are, wherever they are, they can get our services. But then, from a household perspective, what is actually the impact? We're talking about multi-dimensional types of poverty. 
but uh, what is the impact that is happening? And, and that data itself is useful for us to improve the quality of our programming, but then also can work as a mining tool for researchers coming in to evaluate later on as well. Of course, they're going to have their own sets of things. But I think it's important to look at evidence and evaluation uh, as a portfolio of things that you're going to see. Um, uh, you know, our city is being on one hand, and it's very important that I also mentioned that one of the more flagship success stories of our, which has gone global, is the ultra poor graduation uh, program, which was actually became global because of a very thorough, rigorous evaluation that happened by, uh, for example, JPAL, where OBJ and Astro Dufla were involved in that. And uh, so originally the program started in Bangladesh. But then once we got good results, then a, couple, a few donors came in and said that we want to replicate that uh, you know, to the outside, different continents in six countries. And we want to also couple this with strong RCTs. And so then JPAL came in. And then this program was designed for the six continents, designed and then RCT happened. It's a prolonged thing. It started in 2007, that first step. Then it, the final results got published in 2015 in the science magazine. But when it did, then there was so much interest from the government, from others, and now it's being replicated in different contexts in 46 countries as well. Uh, so, so essentially, I think that, idea, that um, the idea is that the, if, you, uh, if you look at this as in one, one, one ex, uh, spectrum, where you involve researchers from a very early days and, and with a goal that to see that whether this is a gold standard programming, uh, then that can do also wonder for, for, from an advocacy perspective because you don't need so many innovations in this space. I think it's important to think that if, you, if something works, it's not important to reinvent the wheel. It's important to reinvent the wheel for a different country, as in like for that contextual, but you don't have to reinvent an entire wheel. So, uh, so, so yeah, I just wanted to make that point that, you know, in, I think in a in old world and new world, I think both has places and there are things that are changing, but the portfolio of interventions from an evidence perspective is important. So I'd like to move to yeah. some of the discussion points that have come up uh, in the chat window that I've seen and uh, repeated intervention and some upvotes. Uh, so one uh, is that um, we, we already talked about how this panel overrepresented overrepresents sort of international development work, not domestic. Another one is that this panel overrepresents large organizations working on large programs and large amounts of money, et cetera. Right? And BRAC is the world's largest NGO, for example, that's operating in multiple countries now, even though it started in Bangladesh. And one set of concerns from the uh, from the audience, uh, uh, a right set of concerns is that, you know, if we are talking about this very sophisticated evidence-driven policy making, right, uh, which, is, which large organizations are capable of doing if anybody is, right, and large donors are able to fund and handle, but are we then uh, creating a casualty here, which is that small organizations are not, are being left by the wayside and they're having trouble uh, getting attention or getting support when they're doing work at their scale that might be equally effective, even though it's not possible for us to rigorously establish that using the same standards of evidence. So any thoughts, I mean, especially if you've been associated with small organizations in the past? Yeah, you know, I think it's a great question. Um, but again, when we talk about evidence-based philanthropy, uh, the point is to figure out what's the right level of evidence and the different sources of information in order to come to a conclusion on a particular question. And so we've been talking a lot about large scale programs and randomized controlled trials, but I think the principles of evidence-based decision-making apply also to small organizations that don't have the resources or the reach to invest in you know, a bunch of treatment sites and a bunch of control sites. Um, so what do I mean by that? You know, I think starting from the fundamental of drawing out your theory of change. So what are the th activities you're gonna do as an organization? And why do you believe that those are ultimately gonna lead to some improvement in outcomes for the communities that you care about? And then looking at each step in that theory of change and what are the critical assumptions 
And do you actually believe those? And I think even if you can't be measuring everything yourself in the form of a large scale impact evaluation, what you can do is take that theory of change, identify the weakest assumptions, and then go to other programs and evidence to see, do those tend to play out um, historically? And then what are the key indicators that I should be collecting so that I can actually test the weakest links in my program? And so, you know, even if you can't do the large scale or, or more complex um, impact evaluations, I think applying those principles of drawing out why you think your inputs and activities are going to lead to an outcome you care about, and then very smartly and, and parsimoniously choosing the data you're going to collect in order to get a better view of, are we actually delivering what we think we will? And if we do deliver those things, is that going to lead to an improvement in people's lives? I think um, you know is, is a useful place to start and can get you a lot of the way there, frankly, uh, if you're a smaller organization. Perhaps I can just add two quick points, Samuel Fick. Uh, so the first is along what Buddy also said. I don't think everybody has to do everything. Uh, again, to take the I am involved informally and in supporting a number of very small organizations back home in Tanzania and Kenya and Uganda um, who, 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 don't, who are not generating this huge evidence, but they are consumers of this evidence and using that to tailor their programs around pedagogy and how they engage and what works uh, uh, and, and, and are finding that very effective in the work they do. So that's point one. Point two, though, I do think that for us funders, we need to take a look at who we're funding. And, and I, for one, think that way too much money goes to international NGOs, uh, way too little money goes to organizations at country level, uh, including for using evidence and generating evidence. And we need to, we need to change that balance. So for example, for co-impact, uh, one of the ways in which we have changing our criteria is going forward, 100% of our country level grants are going to be made to organizations that are, you know, rooted in and led by Global South organizations. So that, you know, those sorts of shifts, I think, are also going to be important to kind of right size and, and correct for the for the sort of, uh, you know, decolonized philanthropy, if you will. Yeah, uh, obviously, this is not a... This is fundamental issue it's not a problem that we can solve in this panel but i thank the audience for bringing it to our attention and i think uh you know if we sort of socialize these ideas then hopefully it gets into the uh, the stream of consciousness of everybody who's playing large roles here so another uh set of questions that came from the audience is about the role of the ultimate let's say the end user or the ultimate beneficiary right and their um viewpoints and how uh, their challenges, uh, their feelings of whether this program is helping them or not, et cetera, plays into evidence generation. Right? Um, so how much attention are we paying to sort of um, uh, anonymous data collection as opposed to, or, or, or not, maybe anonymous is not the right word, um, like data collection that's uh, separated from the end user versus paying attention to the end user's feelings about how well the, whether the program is working in their community or not, right? Anyone would like to comment on that? Um, yeah, you know, I can, I can comment from GiveWell's perspective and, and frankly also from, from ID Insights to a certain extent. So, you know, when GiveWell is thinking about allocating our resources as a funder, as I said at the beginning, we're hyper focused on this question of how can we do as much good as possible. And so what that often ends up being is us having some moral stance on what we consider to be the good. Um, and in our case, that's either saving lives or improving consumption. Um, and then we're trying to maximize the amount of good we can do on those dimensions with a fixed pool of capital. Um, but something that we realized is anyone that's trying to figure out how to do as much good as possible is going to be choosing between different types of good. Should I save someone's life by investing in anti-malarial bed nets, or should we make investments in direct cash transfers or other programs that improve consumption? So how do we actually value um, improving health or saving lives versus improving consumption versus improving education? And I think, you know, one of the things that GiveWell has done is actually turn that question back to the communities that are impacted by these programs. And so in partnering with ID Insight, doing a lot of work on what we call moral weight. So if a community is faced with making trade-offs, whether the funding is coming from a government, uh, an NGO run program, or a donor, there's always some choice on how much should go to 
health and life-saving programs versus income improving programs. Um, and too many of those decisions are being made at the headquarters of NGOs, of global funders or of donors. And what we're trying to do is actually collect the data rigorously by asking community members some pretty tough thought experiments. You know, there's gonna be X million dollars in your community. With that money, you can either save the lives of 3,000 people or double the incomes of 40,000 people. Which would you choose and why? And there's no right answer to that, but I think starting to ground those high level resource allocation questions and the actual preferences of the communities impacted by the programs rather than in some kind of like abstract um, reasoning exercises that are happening in Delhi or Dhaka or London or, or New York um, is at least a start to put the preferences of communities affected by programs much higher up the chain in, in making these big funding decisions. Maybe I could just jump in on that. Thanks, buddy, um, <clears throat> for for that. I think an extension that of that work that is really fascinating, and I would really trying to get things um, get some support for it. Honestly, is to look at the issue of dignity and respect in terms of the delivery and receipt of services from either NGOs or the government. And you know, others not at ID Insight, but others have have really um, kind of pushed the methodological frontier on measuring this concept of dignity. And I think increasingly we're seeing the you know, correlation between, for example, you know, respect in the delivery of maternal uh, health care and birth outcomes. Uh, a whole range of ways in which respect and dignity play into the effectiveness, the concrete effectiveness of uh, service delivery and other kinds of programmatic work. And so I think that's an extension, not only kind of community values in the allocation of resources, but a uh, uh, real integration of this concept of dignity and respect in the delivery of services. Uh, so uh, if any, any thoughts on how BRAC engages with end users? Uh, you're on mute. Sorry. That, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, th I think essentially uh, there is a constant feedback loop because I, I, so it's an, uh, in a way a lot of our design the program design we have uh, very much at the, the sort of the folks from the community are quite ingrained in the design so so that that, that feedback loop is, is very much there. the ultra poor graduation program that I mentioned that they at the villagers actually decide who in their village actually deserves to get the asset transfer support and then we do the health ver health, uh, wealth verification. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, similar to that, and I think, you know, so the st schools that run, uh, the, this is the same community housewife who's, who's part of that. So it's very much, so she's the teacher who's actually uh, been trained. So, so the whole idea behind it is that, A, you get better feedback um, um, from your end user, what's working, what's not working, but at the same time, uh, you actually, uh, whether there's BRAC or not, I mean, I think, you know, the, the impact stays. I mean, there are places where we have shut down schools. We have figured, uh, we have found out that some of those teachers have started their own schools. Um, and, and that is essentially the, the, the beauty of that, that, is, uh, that, you know, the impact stays, whether, whether the organization stays or not. Um, so I, I want to actually comment on another um, uh, issue that uh, was raised in the in the in the chat, and this is not going to be a question to anyone in particular, just a, just a general comment. Uh, so somebody noted the lack of diversity in the panel and called this a manal or approximating a manal, and uh, in spite of Ruth's presence here, and uh, yeah, so something that um, yeah, I mean, so the point is. Uh, uh, well taken, that this is not as gender balanced as it could be given the numbers of, uh, of heads that are on the screen. Uh, but I'd also like to point out that, you know, the, the organizers here, the students, while taking on a full course load, did an amazing job of gathering really impressive people together. And when I, when uh, the organizations, uh, organizers approached me, and, and I also was thinking about diversity, but I was actually more concerned about diversity in other dimensions, like given the con the context and the and the content of this panel, which is so. For example, I'm not going to go through you know in what order we invited people, but 
Um, but it was, I thought that the diversity of viewpoints that was even more important to represent was not even more so than gender. It is not just like the US viewpoint of donors who are sitting in the United States and sending money, but what about the, the people who are being asked to generate the evidence, right? And, um, and the people who are, uh, who are being uh, evaluated on the basis of that evidence, right? I thought that's a, that's a viewpoint that was uh, even, uh, even more important. And then the other, you know, and so it's important for us to also acknowledge, you know, what this panel does, but what the limitations are, right? As we've already pointed out, um, this panel um, is not particularly well suited for us to answer all the questions around what are the challenges for small organizations, right? It's not particularly well suited for those types of funding schemes. We can't solve those problems here. So, um, so I mean, each panel uh, like has a purpose, right? And let's at least acknowledge like what the limitations and the boundaries of our of our purpose are. Right? And you know, it's it's great that I mean we have this word that uh, rhymes with panel and mantel, but somehow you know we also see the absence of black and brown people in a lot of panels, right? I'm I'm happy to say over here we have somebody who uh, represents Africa. We probably have way over representation of Bangladeshis on this panel, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and 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 that of course also matters. I wish we had another word that rhymed with panel that that uh, acknowledged the lack of uh, diversity in those dimensions as well. Um, okay, so with that said, let me now turn back to the to the uh, content that we were discussing, and and you guys have all told us really nice stories about the importance of evidence and how sometimes evidence led to really great things happening in the future. Like Atif told the story of the ultra poor graduation program that started in Bangladesh that then got replicated in uh, many different countries around the world on the basis of the strength of evidence, right? Where there was a very thorough and joint partnership between researchers and implementers, okay? So these, um, uh, so, so all of the stories that you talked about, Rakesh told us a story about how understanding the the limitations based on once evidence was generated and understanding the limitations of the theory of change that he had in mind, how it changed fundamentally how he thought about education in Tanzania. Right? This is all great to hear, and I, I just wanted to make sure that we also hear the stories of the opposite type. Right? Are there cases where, uh, by insisting on evidence, we actually ended up undermining the effectiveness of a program or or there's a program that you believe should have continued or should have been scaled up right but given the way the evidence-based world is structured and the constraints it imposes on us we end up we end up in a worse place than we otherwise would have been does anything come to mind and if even if the answer from all of you is no that's also instructive yeah. for us and um, Mushfak, you know i think it's a great question and it's definitely come up um in my experience several times, I won't name the specific organizations because you know, I think ultimately the insistence on evidence too early in the organizational's development ended up hamstringing the org and, and in some cases causing them um, to shutter their windows. So I think the main takeaway for me is that in as we think about evidence-based decision-making and funding decisions, we have to think about what is the right level of evidence in the journey of an organization's idea. And a problem that I see increasingly is that some organizations, especially smaller early stage startups, think that the rigorous RCT is the great unlocker of more funding. And so they rush too early to actually evaluate their program rigorously when they actually have a sound idea, but they have to work through a lot of the operational challenges of figuring out how to tailor that sound idea to the communities in which they're working to figure out operational challenges, management challenges, scaling challenges. And so I think the single biggest takeaway for me is that um, there is some risk of good ideas run by exceptional groups ending up dying because they rush to rigorous impact evaluation too early in their organizational journey. And I think the lesson for um, funders is to say, let's give orgs the time and space to work out the operational kinks, to adapt a good idea to their community and have some lighter touch ways to make sure that they're on the right track and only insist on the more rigorous evaluation once that uh, org and once that idea is mature enough to actually undergo the scrutiny to see whether it's counterfactually improving lives. Um, so that's 
that's one big takeaway for me from from several programs that I've seen that are rushed into rigorous evaluation too early to their detriment. I think what Buddy describes is is very true for the organization called Tuaweza, where I used to work at. Um, we we had a, a group of board members and a group of staff who was dedicated to doing rigorous evaluation, inspired by not just doing anecdotal stuff. And so that we just kind of dive right in. We did do some RCTs. Um, and in our case, it was, I think, a combination of perhaps not being mature enough um, in terms of our hypotheses and program, but also not taking into account the complexity, the point you made uh, earlier, Mushfik, as well as the time lag, right? So if you, when you're trying to do certain deep things, which may take 10 years, how do you then design an evaluation process that 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 you know captures whether you're on the right track? What would be the research course? And we just were not to do that for ourselves. And what then happened is once the RCT showed that we were not having the sort of impacts that we were, we abandoned, which with hindsight now in my view was something that was quite promising instead of adapting it and coming up with better research questions, we we moved on to something else in you know prematurely and I don't I re, I still regret that. Um, so Ruth or Asif, any uh, were you ever as an implementer at, at BRAC, were you ever put in a position where you felt like you were having to make a tough choice? Uh, no, I think in a, essentially, I think one interesting uh, sort of insight uh, was that uh, that you can you don't necessarily have to use um, RCT for uh, evaluation only. I mean, I think you know essentially RCT for asking some design questions as well, right? So I think that uh, that we have done. I, um, we, we, uh, I, I mean, I, I absolutely, I guess I don't have a specific story to tell, but I can tell that we have used RCT to uh, not evaluate an early stage program, but to evaluate a sort of what components of the program are more effective than the others, so that we can actually take a decision on scaling. Because when we do the scaling, we have to be uh, mindful of that. We want to be effective and cut the sort of fat. Uh, it's a, a, and and what, are, what are the fat? I mean, I think that's that's one way to uh, find out is through uh, through some of these artificial design. So, so uh, I agree that from overall impact design, you shouldn't uh, be doing it early because there's a lot of tweaking that need to do. But in the early stage, you can do to figure out individual components effectiveness. I think that help, that is, that is very helpful for our scale up. Okay, and um, maybe um, you know, given that we have a lot of the attendees here who represent uh, organizations that are trying to generate evidence and be responsive to say donor demands, right? Uh, I'd love to get your now like move to sort of. Uh, I don't know, vocational skills part of this panel, okay? which is, are there any tricks you can think of to navigate these demands? Right? So things like, are there ways, you know, given that everybody is operationally constrained, financially constrained, right? What are the what are the ways and things that they, that especially small organizations who are more constrained can adopt um, uh, such that they can be responsive to the need for, for evidence? Any kind of I'm looking for any practical insights, I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. let me let me offer a couple, and this is to some extent more um, from my experience uh, uh, working eight years at the Hewlett Foundation as a grant maker. So I think that there are two ways in which organizations of any size can signal to funders that they are the right um, organizations to fund. Uh, so one is that they can demonstrate that they are using the available evidence for the design of their programs. And this is remarkably infrequent 
uh, that there's any sort of documentation that a design of a program that's being proposed is informed by all of the experience beyond that of the individual organization really remarkably unusual and so that's a distinguishing feature if you can say sort of you know say we're building on the body of evidence and addressing maybe a, a gap maybe something that is not yet uh, understood but we have a tradition and a, and a evidence base we're building from so uh, that's one thing and the other is to really demonstrate that on an ongoing basis you're a learning organization that as as he says you you're trying one thing and figuring out if it works and if it does you pursue it if it doesn't you move to a different way to solve to to, to reach the mission there are many 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 organizations that sort of have an idea of what needs to be done, whether or not it's based on existing evidence, and they pound it. It's like that is the thing they will do come hell or high water. And that is a very different kind of approach than saying we are here to solve a problem that we know people in a given community have, and we're going to find the best way to solve that problem. And it may be what we start with as an idea, and it will certainly evolve over time. So I think both of those things, build on existing evidence base in an explicit way, or, or say you're informed by that, and demonstrate in an authentic way that you're a learning organization. Those are, those are so rare as to be um, really uh, quite, um, quite important determinants of whether some foundations would fund you. On a plus one, what Ruth said, and I think one of the best things a funder can do in the past, when I was a grantee of the Hewlett Foundation, this is what I really appreciated about it, is is they showed real interest and curiosity in what we were learning. So the question was not show us the results. Period. The question was what are you grappling with? We understand this is hard, and getting excited when we shared the kind of nuanced results and we shared how some of our hypotheses were not working in practice a funder can do a lot in signaling interest and excitement about those sorts of questions okay absolutely and can i just say one thing i mean I, this is also uh, very important just to add to what rakesh is saying it was also uh, to show that vision um, uh, to the funder as well that what you're trying to do uh, and sell that vision because i think essentially ultimately that gives you uh, gives them the confidence that uh, you have clarity on where you want to go with this and then uh, essentially uh, and having that authenticity to share uh, that uh, and nuances absolutely rakesh you, you know again uh, you know mushwig you mentioned the case of vocational training and there are a lot of money being spent here right and i can tell that and most of this money is going down the drain honestly speaking because as the easiest way to uh, figure out is not an rct you just call up the people who got the training and see how much are they uh, are they do they have any employment right now because the end goal of the skills training is for them to find an employment so that they can get some income uh, and if they don't uh, then why they're not getting it and i think essentially uh, that's the easiest way to evaluate the okay, success of a vocational training program. But but how many of are doing it? And most of these people are trade, ticking the boxes. I know a lot of NGOs in Bangladesh are just doing tailoring training when there are no jobs in tailoring uh, because the donors have asked them to do that uh, because they want to spend some money on vocational training. So, <laughs> so. Okay. I, I, uh, we, we do need to move to... Um, a breakout room so that people have an opportunity to um, in, more informally interact with the panelists and with each other. Um, I wish we weren't leaving this with the anecdote about how donors have asked uh, for, a, for a completely inappropriate training <laughs> and, then, and then the uh, implementers have to follow that. Uh, I think that I, hopefully that's not a representative anecdote from, from how, how this world works. Um, so let's. Uh, so let me just first uh, thank all of the panelists for sharing your valuable time with us. Um, and people are in different time zones. You know, it's we started very early in some places, like in California, and we're getting late in Dhaka and Bangladesh. 
And uh, thank you also to Josh and the other organizations of the Yale Philanthropy Conference for, um, uh, for, for putting together this really exceptional, excellent panel. And thank you to uh, all of the um, attendees for engaging, right, for keeping the chat window active. And that also gave us a lot of uh, fruit for discussion here. Okay? And Josh, do you want to come in and let people know how to enter the breakout room? Sure. Can you hear me? Thank you so, so much. This has been a terrific, terrific panel. I'm sure I'm not the only one that learned a lot um, from all your uh, remarks and experiences. Um, so I've posted a